All right, team. So in this video, we're going to be talking about converting EBIT and EBITDA to free cash flow to the firm and free cash flow to equity. But first, why would we do that? In my opinion, the purpose of understanding the financial statements is really twofold. You want to know how a business generates cash and the risk it's assuming to do so. That's it, full stop. And cash being the most important variable. But EBITDA and EBIT are constantly used in valuation exercises, especially in private equity. On top of that, EBITDA is frequently cited as a proxy for cash flow which can be dangerous if you don't understand how to convert between the two. And that's what we'll be exploring in this video, so let's dive in. To work through this exercise, we're going to be using this template, which has a three statement model on the left hand side and our calculations for free cash flow on the right hand side. And you'll note that this is a fully integrated three statement model with an income statement, balance sheet, cash flow statement. And if we scroll down two supporting schedules, including the debt schedule and the PP&E schedule. And note that the balance sheet's balanced, which gives us a solid foundation to work from. And if you'd like to really understand the three statement model framework, I suggest two courses on ASM, the Introduction to Financial Statements and the video series titled Integrating Financial Statements. I think this framework is one of the most important things to understand as an aspiring analyst or investor. And I'll be referencing content from the Introduction to Financial Statements throughout this video. Now to make this template fit on the screen, I did embed a few hard coded numbers. Here's an example where operating expenses or SGNA is projected as 15% of revenue throughout the period. It's not great modeling practice, but this model is just intended to be pretty and small as a visual aid. So I broke a few rules. Now on the right hand side, we have calculations starting with EBIT and EBITDA and working towards free cash flow and free cash flow to equity. We're going to reference our tax rate in these formulas. So I have it isolated at the top. And to walk through these formulas one by one, let's start with a blank template. And for our first calculation, we'll be working towards free cash flow to the firm, which is the cash available to all providers of capital, including debt, equity, and everything in between. As a quick recap, recall from the financial statement series that a balance sheet can be divided into three categories, assets, liabilities, and stockholders equity. A company uses its assets to generate revenue. This is what the company owns. And the means of owning these assets is supported by providers of debt and equity. If you assume that the liability side of the balance sheet is limited to the bank providing debt to purchase assets, and that the equity side of the balance sheet represents shareholders that have contributed capital to fund the business, then free cash flow to the firm represents the cash available to these two groups. In other words, it's the amount of cash available after the company has paid all its business expenses and covered investments in assets like inventory and equipment, but before capital providers realize any benefit. So free cash flow to the firm represents the cash available to providers of debt for borrowed money and equity. Free cash flow to equity, in contrast, represents the cash available to shareholders only. And we'll expand on that momentarily, but first let's get back to free cash flow to the firm. The formula starts with the product of EBIT and one minus the tax rate. Humans in finance call this tax affected EBIT because it's EBIT that includes the impact of taxes. Paying taxes obviously requires cash if you don't want to annoy the IRS, so we got to net it out. And what you'll notice is that to better illustrate how these calculations work, the calculations link directly to the financial statements in our three statement model and the input for the tax rate above. I'll explain why at the conclusion of the video, but for now it should make it easier to follow along. The next step is to add back depreciation and amortization, which can be found on the cash flow statement. As we learned in the videos covering the income statement and cash flow statement, these are non-cash items. Recall that this gets subtracted from net income on the income statement, which you can see here, and gets added back on the cash flow statement. So the net effect on cash in our model is zero. We are adding it back in the formula because EBIT includes depreciation and amortization. After that, we subtract changes in working capital. This formula links to the cash flow statement and reverses the value because we've shown it as a cash outflow. To avoid any confusion surrounding the negative sign in this formula, I have a calculation for the change in working capital using the balance sheet right here. This takes the increase in current assets, then the increase in current liabilities and subtracts the former from the latter to arrive at change in working capital. I find a lot of people get this wrong when referencing the cash flow statement, so I wanted to provide a way to check yourself. Finally, we subtract capital expenditures, the cash a company uses to buy property, plant, and equipment. And this can also be found on the cash flow statement. Per these helpful notes, we can then calculate free cash flow to the firm as tax affected EBIT plus depreciation and amortization, less changes in working capital less capex to arrive at $273. Not that exciting, but you can assume this schedules in trillions if you want to. Now, if you want to start this calculation with EBITDA instead, then you need to make one change. I'm going to switch views so we can follow some riveting depreciation and amortization math calculations. The formula starts in a similar fashion, but instead of tax affected EBIT, we have tax affected EBITDA. 
As the acronym states, in this case, depreciation and amortization have not been subtracted from this measure of earnings. And you can also see that it's included in the formula. So we have already added back depreciation and amortization times one minus the tax rate, which in this case is equal to $53. That means the portion of depreciation and amortization remaining as an add back is depreciation and amortization times the tax rate. Sum these two figures and you get the full value of depreciation and amortization. Otherwise, these formulas are very similar and you get the same result. So that's cool. I don't love the spacing here, so I'm going to switch back to the original view to deal with some slight OCD tendencies. Much better. To start working towards free cash flow to equity, let's go back to this visual. If free cash flow to equity represents the cash available to shareholders, and it does, then we have to subtract payments expected by our debt holders. Again, we're making the assumption that liabilities in this case are limited to debt for borrowed money to keep it simple. And debt holders expect interest expense and repayments of principal in a very timely manner. Once those two items are subtracted, we have free cash flow to equity. So starting with free cash flow to the firm. In this formula, we subtract cash interest expense times one minus the tax rate and the amount of debt repaid in the period to arrive at free cash flow to equity, which per the formula, free cash flow to the firm less interest expense times one minus the tax rate plus net borrowing is equal to $201. And what you'll notice is that this is precisely the sum of net cash flow generated in the period on the cash flow statement. And this is really important to understand. The better you understand this three statement model framework and how each transaction impacts cash, the easier all of this is. It creates a framework in your mind so that you can do these calculations without any of this Excel nonsense. I love Excel, but you know what I mean. And I'll demonstrate what I'm trying to explain with a couple examples. All these formulas are doing is mirroring what happens in a three statement model. For example, if you start with EBIT and subtract interest expense and taxes, you have net income. If you then mirror the changes on the cash flow statement, adding back depreciation and amortization, subtracting changes in working capital, subtracting capital expenditures, and adding back net borrowing, which in this case is a negative because we paid down debt, then you get the exact same result. If you start with EBITDA, the only difference is that you don't have to add back depreciation and amortization because it's already included in your starting number. And here's another cool example of how three statement models work. We previously said that the difference between free cash flow to the firm and free cash flow to equity is the payments expected by the company's debt holders, which includes interest and net borrowing. But if we remove those values from this calculation for free cash flow to equity, you'll see that we don't get the result for free cash flow to the firm. So what's going on? Well, interest expense reduces the amount of taxes that you pay. It's effectively a tax shield because it reduces your pre-tax income. With the current amount of interest expense running through our three statement model, we show a value of $78 for income tax expense. But if you delete interest expense on the income statement, the amount of taxes paid increases to $84. A well-built three statement model is dynamic and it will automatically respond to changes in inputs. And since this calculation links to our three statement model, you'll see that we now have the correct value for free cash flow to the firm. Master the financial statements in the three statement model framework and all this stuff comes easy. All right, team, that's all for now. Thanks for watching.